dear friends, dear audience, thank you so much for being here. I know it's quite a sacrifice on a day like today, a Friday, sunny, sunny Friday afternoon to, uh, to give up the outside, the pleasures of the outside to come here. But I, I really hope and I believe that uh, this afternoon and the speech from Dr. Durham will make it um, more, than, more than worthwhile. Just a couple of uh, logistical related things, points to start with. Obviously, I'm sure everyone has their phones to silence, so thank you for that. One of the objectives of today is to sort of, I guess, amplify the messages around the importance of promoting and protecting uh, human rights, international law, including international humanitarian law. So please feel free to, you know, use the platforms of social media, Twitter and whatever else your preferred platform is to uh, continue to amplify those messages. There is on the back of your program a, uh, a little hashtag about today's address, so um, maybe that's a good organising principle for those uh, who um, want to take up that opportunity. So today, um, the Australian Embassy is really, truly pleased and very honoured to, to join with our partners, the Raoul Wallenberry Institute and the Raoul Wallenberry Academy, uh, to put on this inaugural Raoul Wallenberry address. Um, some of you will know about the important work that the Institute and the Academy do, but not all of you will. So let me ta just take a few moments to, to talk a bit about our partners and then I'll move into some, some other comments. The Raoul Wallenberry Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law uh, is a research and academic institution with offices and programs covering 40 countries. It has one foot in academia and another on the ground uniting theory and practice, combining evidence-based research on human rights with direct engagement with partners to bring, to bring about human rights change for all. Its mission is to contribute to a wider understanding of and respect for human rights and international humanitarian law. Its vision is to bring about just and inclusive societies with the effective realisation of human rights. The Raoul Wallenberry Academy is a non-profit organisation founded in 2001 by, um, among others, uh, Raoul Wallenberry's sister, Nina Lagergreen. The Academy acts in the spirit of Raoul Wallenberry by supporting young people to find the courage to make a difference. Um, it does this in many ways, including by offering leadership and human rights education for high school students. On Raoul Wallenberry Day, which is the 27th of August each year, which is also Sweden's National Day for Equal Rights and Civil Courage, the Academy awards the Raoul Wallenberry Prize to a person working in Sweden to raise awareness among children and youth about the dangers of xenophobia and intolerance. And we have um, some Raoul Wallenberry Prize winners among us today, but more of that later. So you can see from these brief descriptions just how pleased the Australian Embassy is to collaborate with um, these two partners in today's address. Today is not a one-off. It's the first in what we plan to be an annual series of, or of uh, Raoul Wallenberry addresses around this time of the year. The catalyst for this inaugural address is that this year marks the fifth anniversary since the grant of honorary Australian citizenship to Raoul Wallenberry. On your program and also on the screen, um, you can see the commemorative stamp that was issued in 2013 to mark this occasion. Only three individuals have been granted this status by Australia, Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa and Raoul Wallenberry, each uh, a truly inspiring humanitarian. So what are we trying to achieve with this address? I've been asked this a couple of times and it's a, it's a very important question. Well, we're aiming to inform, to inspire, to recharge our commitment to protecting and promoting human rights and respect for international law, including international humanitarian law. Also to convey the priority that Australia places on this work and the value that we place on Sweden's partnership in advancing this agenda. We really do have an amazing collection of guests here. It's a, it's a, it's a quality crowd that you've got um, to, to, 
to spend the, the afternoon with. Um, to the representative of the Sami community, a very warm welcome. Likewise, of course, a special welcome to the representatives of the Jewish community of Stockholm. We have people from civil society, the corporate sector, university students and professors, Swedish government officials, including former ambassadors to Australia, colleagues from the diplomatic community, including Israel's ambassador, Ben Dove, uh, journalists, all human rights supporters. So I mentioned earlier some inspiring humanitarians, and on that note, I, I'd like to make a special mention of a number of survivors who, uh, of the Holocaust who grace us and honour us with their presence today. I had five minutes for these comments, but I'm going to extend it, um, give myself permission to extend it a few minutes to talk about a couple of the survivors who are here. Um, firstly, Ms. Ms. Heidi Fried, uh, who's in the front row. Heidi, thank you so much um, for being here. Heidi is a, a writer and, and psychologist dedicated to spreading the message about the importance of democracy in combating xenophobia, using her own experiences as a Holocaust survivor to address these issues. Heidi was born in 1924 in Transylvania, um, in a part that is now Romania. She came to Sweden after a long and complicated um, road during World War II. She was mentioning to me that you know, she was in Auschwitz and then she was in three labour camps and then she was finally liberated from uh, Bergen-Belsen and then through the auspices of the Red Cross eventually made her way through to Malmö and, and, and then up to, to Stockholm. She's lived here in Stockholm since 1945. She has a widely read autobiography, The Road to Auschwitz, Fragments of a Life, that was published in the 1990s in both Swedish and English. I'm certainly going to, to make a point of, of reading it after this uh, afternoon. Heidi won the Raoul Wallenberry Prize in 2015, shared with Emmerich Roth, who is also here today, along with his spouse, Sherston. So, Emmerich, uh, I'm sorry that uh, Emmerich said that he would his preferred languages, and any of these were totally fine, would be Czech or Russian or Hungarian or German or Yiddish or Italian or Swedish. Um, and I can't do justice <laughs> in any of those. You've given me many, many options and I've failed at every hurdle, so I'm, I'm sorry for that. But uh, Emmerich is an author, a lecturer, a social worker, Born in 1924 um, it, well, in what was then Czechoslovakia and today um, uh, is part of the Ukraine. During World War II, Emmerich was deported uh, by the Nazis along with his parents and four sisters. He survived five different concentration camps uh, but lost his entire family. He came to Sweden in 1950 and is still working against violence, hatred and xenophobia. He took the initiative to start an organisation called EXIT, which has helped many young people to quit extreme right-wing <laughs> organisations. He was also the initiator of the association Survivors of the Holocaust in order to spread knowledge, primarily in schools, about the events of World War II and to prevent the spread of racism in Swedish society. In 1994, he also founded the Emmerich Foundation, which aims to encourage young people to combat violence and xenophobia. He's published several books on these topics. One is Emmerich is My Name in 2005. And he's rightly been widely recognised for his work, including as a co-recipient with Haiti of the 2015 Wallenberry Prize. We also um, uh, were hoping, and we had a, another survivor, Kate, Welch, who was hoping to be here today, and perhaps um, if Kate makes it later in the day, I can probably acknowledge her presence. But a special, very sincere thank you to Heidi and Emmerich for, for honouring us today. I think maybe, Emmerich, did I get your birth date wrong? Was it 1924? No. Was it? It was. You, you looked at me and I thought maybe I'd made a mistake there. I just wanted to check. 
<clears throat> you know, we, we, we no fake news from this platform this afternoon. So look, I won't take um, uh, much more time only to say that I think it's very clear that the experience of, of Haiti and Emmerich um, you know, is, is almost unfathomable to, to most of us, but it's truly inspirational, for, I'm sure, to everyone here. And it really calls forth, I think, the need to reflect on the experiences that you've had and, and the need to um, you know, take forward the protection of, of human rights and an understanding and respect for human dignity. So I don't think there's any better way really to reflect than with music. So I'm very pleased to be able to call up to the stage uh, Ms. Mara Piasinecci. That's a very poor attempt. And also Ms. Anna Petraskevica. So I might just use Mara and Anna if that's okay. But Mara and Anna are professional musicians from Latvia now living here in Sweden. Mara came to Sweden to study at the Royal College of Music where she finished her master's degree in musical performance and uh, now performs together with many other international musicians across the Baltic and Scandinavia. And Anna is one of the most recognisable chamber music flautists of her generation in Latvia, mostly performing on academic and contemporary music stages. After moving to Sweden six years ago, she has successfully continued her career in both classical and improvised and jazz. The pieces are listed in your program. I won't go into a description, but suffice to say that they relate to the themes we're discussing today. Thanks very much, Anna.
Thanks so much, Anna and Mara. That was fantastic, really. And we'll, we'll be fortunate to have a little bit more from Anna and Mara during the reception. Now, it's uh, my great pleasure to ask uh, Morton Sherum to come to the stage. Morton's the director of the Raoul Wallenberry Institute to uh, then in introduce uh, Dr. Durham to us. Thanks, Morton. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Distinguished ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, and others. It's uh, also a great pleasure for me to warmly welcome you all here on uh, this uh, warm day. I know a lot of you probably have been torn of staying out there Friday afternoon in the beautiful Stockholm weather and all coming in here. Great to see you all. And it's definitely a very great honor and uh, privilege uh, to present to you here today uh, Dr. Helen Durhan. Uh, Director of International Law and Policy at the International Committee of the Red Cross. I must say, I cannot think of uh, anyone better uh, to open this uh, Raoul Wallenberg address on the fifth anniversary of the granting of honorary citizenship, Australian citizenship, to Raoul Wallenberg. Dr. Durham is truly a committed person. Uh, I think I'm, I could only see your CV back to sort of say these days of university. I'm sure it goes way long before that as well, where you have been deeply involved in humanitarian law issues, humanitarian issues, human rights uh, uh, issues, and uh, all that so far crowned with a very prestigious position as Director of International Law and Policy at the ICRC. And it should be added here that uh, Dr. Durham is uh, actually the first female director in this position. I didn't take time to uh, go through all the, your predecessors, all those who went before you, all the men who were there, but there must have been quite a few because this position is 150 years old. So one could say it's time to get a female in there. So uh, really fantastic that you are there. Dr. Durham, Durham has uh, always combined the uh, academic uh, with uh, the direct engagement uh, in the field and where people live and act. And that, of course, gives a tremendous strength. She has written extensively on humanitarian law issues, in particular addressing the gender aspects and sexual violence as a major topic in humanitarian crisis and, and armed conflict, but also relating to uh, civil society, citizens, how they being dealt treated, as well as the role of NGOs uh, in times of conflict. A very pertinent issue is, of course, the issue that you also addressed on uh, the protection of journalists uh, in, in times of armed conflict. If we just take the war-torn uh, Syria, last year, 12 journalists uh, were killed only uh, in Syria. Globally, it's difficult to get the figures, but the, the figures are very high. So again, an issue which has a real uh, effect on, on people on the ground. International law is the legacy, the legal expression of the values enshrined in the acts and deeds of Raoul Wallenberg. His legacy is therefore a constant reminder to all of us about the key concepts of humanism and what needs to be considered when the world goes to the extreme. And in that light, it is worth considering how come it could be that it was only in 1998 that we actually got the International Criminal Court. And of course, Dr. Durham was there, uh, part of the Australian delegation. And as far as I could see, also being one of the uh, persons who injected and insisted uh, on sexual violence as being part of what the ICC should uh, address. So that was back in 1998. Dr. Durham is uh, not only the academic, writing interesting and important uh, academic works, uh, teaching the students, uh, she's not only the one uh, being at the negotiation, negotiation tables in Geneva and 
uh, Rome and, and elsewhere, she's definitely also the person who is out there in the field. Having traveled extensively in the Pacific, doing training of governments, military, uh, but also the non-state uh, actors, uh, armed actors. Uh, so you have sort of seen the whole circle of all the, the key actors and you know what is what it's like to be in that conflict uh, on the ground. And that is, of course, what makes your work, both in, in the ICRC as well as your academic work, uh, so present and, and relevant. As we all know, it takes courage to uphold these values, the humanitarian and human rights values. Uh, and that is exactly what uh, Dr. Durham will develop for us here today in her speech, that it's called Courage in Complex times, looking backwards, going forward. With these words, it gives me great pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Durham to the rostrum uh, to address the audience. And I have to say, I really look forward to hearing your, your presentation on the issue that occupies us all. So on this uh, nice sunny day in uh, Stockholm, I think we should give Dr. Durham a warm welcome. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that really wonderful introduction. Um, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I was deeply honoured when I was asked by the Australian government, and in particular Ambassador Kenna, to, to deliver the inaugural Wallenberry, Wall I've just learned, Wallenberry address. Now, Mr Wallenberry was a man of breathtaking courage, whose personal interventions in World War II saw the survival of up to 100,000 Jewish people. When the Governor-General of Australia bestowed honorary citizenship on Mr Wallenberry in 2013, our then Prime Minister, the Honourable Julia Gillard, stated, he has a legacy. It is measured in the example he sets for his own, but also for future generations but it is also measured in the tens of thousands of deaths he prevented through his actions. One of the many that he saved, an individual called Frank Vaja, made his life work to honour the man who rescued him and his mother. Now, Mr Vaja is an Australian citizen and he states, Australia was the only country compassionate enough and intelligent enough to grant entry for us and for this I am forever grateful. He was instrumental personally in pushing for the granting of honorary citizenship for Mr. Wallenberry, and he stated in his very Australian way, Mr. Wallenberry was the 21st century's greatest humanitarian. His sheer bloody guts in standing up to murderers brought people back from the jaws of death. So today in paying tribute to Mr. Wallenberry, we must acknowledge that his legacy as a gift is to the living, to the survivors and to the descendants. In remembering his actions, we continue to allow him to give by providing inspiration. Now indeed, when I was reflecting on what I could speak about with you today, what has Mr. Wallenberry given to the world, I kept seeing the word, word courage very closely followed by the word hope in my mind. And thus, I would like to take a moment to pause briefly today and reflect on what courage really means. And then I would like to examine what I think is courage in action or the implementation of courage, which is hope. Now, there are many different definitions of courage. It is described sometimes as elegance under pressure, as the ability to control fear in dangerous situations and as simply being brave and confident enough to do what you actually believe in. Now, Aristotle describes a courageous person as someone who withstands and fears those things necessary to withstand and fear and on account of the right reason acts. And I think from this definition, there's two really interesting elements. The first is that courage, as described by Aristotle, is not just about a lack of fear. It is much more nuanced than that. It is, by definition, 
A courage, a courageous person is not reckless. A courageous person both withstands and is fearful. The second is that the reason for the acts of courage matter. Aristotle's definition talks about the idea for the right reasons. There are many things one can do, but it's about acting for the right reasons. So I think these two elements, we can really add the active nature of courage, that courage calls for action. You cannot be passively courageous. And I think um, Hannah Arendt, a philosopher and German uh, author, made an imp impassioned plea for courage. And she stated, because in politics, not life, but the world is at stake. So if courage relates to acting upon what you believe, the first step, obviously, is knowing what one believes in. And I was delighted to hear in the, the two previous speakers this idea that perhaps what unites us in the room today, we could be sitting on the, in the water, or by the water, enjoying the weather, or sitting here together, is the belief in the intrinsic worth of humanity, the dignity of human beings as human beings, that each person is entitled to respect at all times without adverse distinction um, and based no distinction based on sex, race, nationality, religion, political opinion, or any other similar criteria. The very simple but very precious principle about what it means to be a human. Now, one of the survivors from Budapest who benefited personally from the interventions of Mr. Wallenberry articulates this very point. Susan Tabler states, he made me feel human again. For the first time, I had hope. He showed us that we were not animals, that someone cared about us. And the point of it was that he came himself. He came personally. Now, for the last 20 years, my professional career has been dedicated, as was expressed, um, to international humanitarian law, or the laws of war, or IHL, as we call it, uh, to which the International Committee of the Red Cross has been granted the role of being guardian and promoter of this framework. And we work very closely with our friends and colleagues in the National Red Cross Society, such as the Swedish Red Cross. And I think when I was once again reflecting on some of the stories, the really important stories that come from Mr. Wallenberry's amazing courage, it's this idea about the proximity, the human connection. And it did remind me one of the key principles of the ICRC, International Committee of the Red Cross, is this idea of proximity, that it, you actually have to be with people. And that's why what is very odd when there's conflict occurring, where most organisations go out, we in the ICRC go in. And it's that idea of, of human agency rather than distance. And I must admit myself, in some of my work, whether it be detention visits in places in, in Asia, um, it's walking into a dark cell and actually being with a person as a person and taking information from them to provide Red Cross tracing information back to their families, but there's something very powerful about the human touch. And even quite recently when I was visiting Iraq up north near Mosul, near the camps where the women were detained or uh, had fled there, sometimes it was actually just sitting with women and having a glass of water provided by them to me about their human dignity that they're not just a survivor or a victim, but there is something to exchange as people that is very important. So I found often through my readings of Mr. Wellenberry's work, and perhaps we can talk about it, it was the personal almost sacrifice where he put himself on the line that is obviously an incredible thing we have to hold on today as we usefully use new technologies and digital ways, but also the whites of someone's eyes as a person is incredibly important. Now, the Geneva Conventions, which are the um, main instruments in international humanitarian law, have been ratified by every state, and they reflect this deep principle of humanity. What they say, in essence, condensed in over 484 articles, is that what unites us as human beings is deeper and more profound than, one, than that which divides us that even during the horrors of armed conflict, there is a small space, but a necessary space for humanity. And there's something about the universal ratification of these treaties 
that speak to this principle that they're not tied to one religion, one cultural code or one political framework. Now, they were adopted over 70 years ago, but their words continue to have resonance and play an important role in protecting civilians and respecting human dignity in times of conflict. But indeed, if I may be honest, today sometimes when talking about IHL, whether it be to attorney generals, foreign ministries, ambassadors, uh, the general public, the military, one feels one almost needs to find a courage to be able to articulate the belief that the law makes a difference. And I think in many ways today we are surrounded by a discourse of despair because we see constantly on TV, in the media, on our iPhones, the terrible and unacceptable, unacceptable images of the laws of war being broken. From Syria to Mali to Afghanistan to Myanmar, we see suffering. We see the targeting of hospitals, the cruel treatment of detainees, the use of sexual violence against women and girls, men and boys. So it's too easy to become deeply cynical about the chance for the change or even a hope that indeed we can improve conditions. Now, in the face of such information that tells us every day there is disregard for these humanitarian principles, can we really say that international law, which is over 150 years old, can we really say it's applicable in the modern times? Are we being idealistic or even worse, maybe naive, to keep holding on to these beliefs. Courage and strengthening our belief to counter this perception of despair is very much needed today. Now, the focus on negative news is very understandable. It's often said that no newspaper will ever have the heading, today a plane arrived safely, or today prisoners of war were treated humanely, or even today correct targeting of a military installation saved a thousand lives. Our attention, of course, is drawn to the atrocities, which by definition stand out. And I think as well as the fact that we are sometimes flooded with the instances when the law is broken, there's also what I would call a temporal aspect, a timing aspect. And it reminds me of a story when I, way back when I was first an international lawyer, Rather naive, very excited, and it was the first talk that I, I gave. It was back in the mid to late 1990s, and it was on a topic of the, uh, uh, the impact of anti-personal landmines. And I was there as a Red Cross lawyer, and we had a, a Red Cross nurse and a Red Cross surgeon, and we had a panel talking about the terrible impact these weapons were having, and I was talking about the ideas that were around to create a new treaty. And it came to the question time, and I was all ready to answer legal questions. And I was totally shocked at the really almost aggressive response most of the audience had towards me. And they said, why does the Red Cross waste its money on lawyers? We don't need lawyers. Lawyers just talk. What we need is we need more doctors. We need more surgeons. You know, these, these lawyers are just wasting everyone's time. And, of course, you know, it was, I was wearing my first suit I'd ever brought, and I was a bit sort of, I don't know what I've done <laughs> But then I realise now, 20 years later, 20 years ago, the Red Cross surgeons in the field estimate that it was up to 20,000 individuals a year that were killed or maimed by antipersonal landmines. And today, when I talk to our surgeons, we're talking about 3,000 individuals. Now, it takes time to change human behaviour, um, and I think we have to be really tenacious if we actually want to ensure these things we believe in move forward because that doesn't happen overnight. And for me, that was a very useful uh, experience. It took 20 years. We don't want to have too many of those. But to really understand that sometimes the work that we're all doing right now will have an impact, but in the future. So we've got the issue about a lot of negative news. We've got the issue of the time it takes to change, make changes. But also, I think it's really important to identify how difficult it is to capture good news. Because really what we are looking for is what didn't happen. We're looking for the counterfactual. We're looking for acts of absence, which happen on a daily basis, which are really hard to report. And I think there's no doubt that to capture these sort of things, you need a longer news cycle. You need a, a lens that goes back rather than immediately 24 hours tells us what's happening today. So it's a natural response 
to have um, a negative attitude when we have a negative news cycle. And psychologists describe this as a term called availability heuristica, where we form our beliefs on the information that is most readily available to us. And interestingly today, whilst there is so much information, we can actually channel more thoroughly what we want to engage in. And it reminds me of one of my favorite poets, T.S. Eliot, who wrote, what is the knowledge that we have lost in information? And what is the wisdom that we have lost in knowledge? And he wrote that back in 1950. And I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel I have so much information and so little time to process and get to the heart of what one might call wisdom. So there's something here. I think we do need to acknowledge that the availability of information has not necessarily always translated into greater knowledge or wisdom. And we need to constantly challenge ourselves and others to seek a wider story. We live in a world, ironically today, despite what people think, we live in a world that there has never been more international humanitarian law. There's never been more jurisprudence or case law to demonstrate what is, uh, what is implementable. There's never been more implementation, and nor has this law been better known. And perhaps it is the gap, that gap between the expectations we have and then the reality that we're shown that creates this sense that it's, it's hopeless and, and the world is in a very dark place. And it was really interesting for me that a, a survey that ICRC did uh, last year where we uh, interviewed over 17,000 individuals globally, some from war-torn countries such as Yemen, Iraq, Somalia, Afghanistan, and some from countries that are more peaceful or are not experiencing conflict directly. And this survey asked people what their views are on the laws of war. And I was very heartened to see that over two thirds of this global population believed in the laws of war, thought that when it was explained to them simply, the principles of distinction, distinguish between civilians and combatants, proportionality, precautions in attack, humane treatment of detainees, prohibition of sexual violence. The majority of these people who were explained that, they, they thought it made sense. But what I found even more interesting was that when asked the question, do the laws of war make a difference, 49% of people living in conflict zones, so those experienced, thought that the laws of war did make a difference. But for those living in a country not experiencing armed conflict, only 20% of those people thought it made a difference. So you might have thought it would be the other way around. But in fact, 49, if you're experiencing conflict, thought the laws of war made your life better. 20, if you weren't. And it made me reflect on whether deep cynicism is the luxury of those of us who haven't experienced conflict, might not have experienced uh, a Red Cross tracing message, uh, a, a, a visit in, in detention or a parcel. So I think today, we need courage and hope to strengthen our belief that with a long lens, in fact, we can move forward. There is the capacity to implement instruments that make life better. And we know globally speaking, if we look at the statistics, the number of people who currently die in armed conflict are actually declining quite rapidly if we take the big step back. Statistics indicate that per 100,000 people, Battle deaths, which were up near 300, so 300 individuals per 100,000 people were killed in conflict just after World War II. And today, 1.2 people are killed in armed conflict of 100,000 people. So we've come a long way from 300 to 1.2. And this is proportional statistics, if you really analyze it. And I think that is something that we need to push against the unacceptability of any numbers but actually try and analyze what is it that we have had across the globe to reduce these numbers down. And it's quite hard to accept these because it's intellectual rather than emotional. It's also the fact that uh, post-World War II, the number of genocide and other atrocities have reduced dramatically too. And I won't go through the statistics. And if I was a statistics girl, I would have done a nice slide, but I think perhaps today is not about statistics. But I think what we need to do is actually also look at how we as humans are progressing and identify what is it that is helping us do that. I think another issue at the moment is the 
current struggle with the acts of terrorism. And of course, every act of terrorism requires formidable condemnation. But I think at the same time, we also know, once again intellectually, that the real risk posed by terrorist acts is statistically much smaller compared to those things that we experience daily and have an impact on us. And once again, just a little statistic, globally in 2015, 38,000 people died due to terrorist acts, so a totally unacceptable number. But that same year, 1,250,000 individuals died in car accidents. So I think, once again, it's, it's stepping back and, and just looking at, in a very rational way, where, as humans, we are under threat. And in fact, the nature and purpose, as we know, of terrorism is to cause fear, so, it, so that our, all our attention is fixated on this issue. So we can say, in a way, there has been great success, sadly, in the terrorist model. So what I'm trying to say is often our fear today is disproportionate to the actual risk. And this, we believe in the ICRC, creates a risk of turning and allowing disproportionate responses that dehumanise people, whether, employ, whether it's employing broad brush strokes and rhetoric that divides or demonises people, or by the imposition of policies and laws that do not protect the fundamental guarantees people are owed as people. And often we say, and I know this from my field experience, from my colleagues, my 16, 17,000 colleagues who are in war zones today, that suffering is both a consequence, but it's also a cause of armed conflict. And we know what it means when you treat people who are detained in a dehumanized way, what the consequences are going forward of that. So, what I think we would like, I would like wanted us to reflect on was that when our fear to fact ratio is out, out of balance, we can mistakenly be convinced or, or take into consideration that situations are exceptional, that today we live in exceptional times and therefore that requires exceptional measures which move outside the framework of fundamental guarantees. And I mean, one of the issues I wanted to flag, for example, that I've been working very closely with and um, globally and doing lots of visits to ministries and, uh, and departments of defence is the fate of what we call foreign fighters, the women particularly and children who are, ICRC is currently visiting 2,000 of them in Iraq that are currently being prosecuted in very short trials, sometimes five to ten minutes, and then executed or detained. And the dehumanisation discourse that many European countries don't want to take back these individuals and are quite happy to see them as something that has gone beyond the norm, that is exceptional. And I can tell you, talking to my colleagues, um, the delegates in visiting these women detained and looking at what will happen in a country like Iraq where there is not strong infrastructure in the judiciary and certainly not strong infrastructure in orphanages, what are, what are we creating for the future when we, we treat individuals in this way? So. But this is not for a moment to discount the really serious violations of IHL that occur on a daily basis. The principle of humanity that underpins the Geneva Conventions and that was recalled in the aftermath of the horrors of World War II is still something we need to work very hard for. And this was, of course, the situation that Mr. Wallenberry found, Wallenberry found himself in. He himself came to know the situation in Auschwitz upon arriving in Budapest due to the huge courage of smuggling out of the Auschwitz protocols by two young escapees. And today we also face new challenges. The Geneva Conventions were adopted when armed conflict was basically between states. It was international in nature. Today we see a proliferation of non-international armed conflict. And these conflicts, as I mentioned in the title, are increasingly complex. We see parties to a conflict fragment and multiply and have new parties. Um, and this conflict trap, as we are calling it, can allow the generation of further conflicts. And in fact, I was talking to uh, my colleague, an incredibly brave woman. She is the head of delegation in Syria. And she was telling me that often for her to deliver and to cross lines to deliver humanitarian assistance, they have to negotiate with up to 30 non-state armed groups. 
and many of them with sniper, rifle, sni sniper rifles trained on my colleagues as they do that. So the complexity of making sure that you have kept everyone informed of what you're doing is a really deep problem for a humanitarian organisation like ICRC that has a mandate to go into conflict zones. And in fact, I was deeply impacted a, a, a number of weeks ago, six weeks ago, one of our dear colleagues, an extraordinary young man, was, um, was shot in the head and killed in Yemen. Uh, he had, it was a, a terrible story, he'd just survived cancer, had gone through chemotherapy, just got his life back on track and went to Yemen to do detention visits, which at the moment are critical uh, for the survival of thousands and thousands of people. And in an, in an ICRC car, he was shot, uh, shot dead. And the complexity we have today is, particularly if I must admit, as a director of, of law with my colleague, the director of operations, is to try and understand what happened. Was it an armed group that w were disagreeing with what the ICRC was doing? Because if that's the case, we need to withdraw. Was it criminal, a criminal element? Was it sending a message? Was it accidental? And I think there's something in trying to understand the pathology of conflict today. Um, when I send young lawyers into the field, if I send them to Mali or Syria or Afghanistan, to understand where are those we need to negotiate with and where are those that don't understand who we are. And ironically, sometimes in the past, the greatest risk to the ICRC has been by foreign fighters who come into a country and haven't had the long history of seeing the ICRC visit their brothers in detention and understand them. So it's always very complex when we're looking at the breakdown of the traditional one or two parties to a conflict. And that's something today we're seeing has an impact on the commission of atrocities. Conflicts are not just increasingly uh, complex with the parties, they're increasingly last longer, they're protracted. And this has another impact, I think, on the fact that we've got young children that grow up to be adolescents and then grow up to adults and all they know is conflict. And the protracted nature of conflict is something we're really struggling with at the moment. And finally, we're finding conflicts are increasingly urbanised, which pose even greater risks for, to civilians, where, of course, fighting in cities is never new, but when particular weapons are used in highly densely populated areas, the impact can be extremely devastating. And finally, the idea that it's not just victims immediately that are attacked, but it's when the essential infrastructure is destroyed, when the sewage systems, electricity, the water sanitation, we see that increasingly as a, as a matter we need to focus upon. So, ladies and gentlemen, we need courage to imagine and to think and to work towards things getting better, which is what we call hope in action. When we think about the inherent worth of humanitarian principles, which applied at all times, we challenge the dominant discourse of the news cycle that is negative. We take a step back and take a longer lens. When we directly face the challenges of today with the conviction in the belief of humanity, we go boldly. We look the beast in the eye and challenge the narrative of total negativity. We move forward knowing that the world is not a hopeless place and our job is not to stay with the problem analysis but to look for solutions. And I think in closing, what is important to reflect upon is that the real power in hope, for example, is that it's contagious. We rightfully reflect on the example of Mr. Warren Berry today but it's also useful to remember the effect he would have had on others around him. It would have not been possible to issue the number of the travel passes, to establish safe houses, to personally intervene in preventing deportations, were it not for the donors, the clerks, the printing people, the drivers, the translation, and the political leadership. So the courage of one individual as a leader can have a multiplication effect of those around them. The active protection campaign launched by Mr. Wallenberry gave renewed energy to other organisations and to neutral states to follow suit. For example, the issuing of the Swedish passes prompted other neutral states to start to do the same. And Mr. Wallenberry's active negotiations for protected houses 
Also, I know from getting my colleagues to look in the archives, inspired the International Committee of the Red Cross. The great Martha Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. once said, the courage breeds creativity. The world always needs more creativity. In the face of fear and with the lack of interest in our fellow beings, Mr. Wallenberry leaves a legacy that is not just about the lives he saves. It is about the demonstration of courage and the need to have a hope that the world is better and to risk everything for that precious principle of humanity. Thank you. You know, very moving and uh, sincere thanks. So uh, now we have an opportunity to have some um, questions and answers and I really do encourage you all to uh, try and participate. Um, there's so much, I think, to explore in, in what uh, Dr. Durham has presented to us. Uh, you know, the importance of the direct human connection. Aristotle, Hannah Arendt, touching on the news cycle, social media, the availability, heuristica. T.S. Eliot, the fear to fact ratio, the conflict trap, the pathology of conflict, the need for this courage, this hope in action, to believe and to articulate and to act that actually we can, that, that law matters, international law matters, and that we can make a difference, that the world isn't a hopeless place. I fully believe in your point, Dr. Durham, about the, the contagion of hope, and I guess this address is another example of how um, Raoul Wallenberry's courage has happily infected the Australian Embassy as well through the <laughs> Wallenberry address. And we can see it in the Institute and the Academy. So I know my limits, and so I'm going to pass through to the experts um, to take your questions. Um, so Dr. Durham, if I can ask you to come to the centre along with Morton uh, from the Institute and also Ms. Sarah Scheller from the Raoul Wallenberry Academy, uh, who'd be very happy to uh, engage in a conversation with uh, whoever might have um, some questions. So, I'll wait for the... I, I'm not, I, yes, thank you, up on the left. Thanks very much. There is a roving microphone, so thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, Ms. Derb, I'd like to, uh, to thank you. Maybe I should introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Nicholas, and I'm... Uh, from the Uppsala Association of International Affairs. And uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Ms. Durham, for a very uh, interesting and inspirational speech. Uh, and I'd also like to extend a thank you to the Australian Embassy, who so kindly uh, invited us here. Uh, and I have uh, two questions, one aimed first uh, to the, the entire panel on the uh, increasing uh, commonality of uh, civil conflicts. This is perhaps not a new development, but I'm wondering how should uh, international conflict law uh, change to be more responsive to, to civil conflicts, perhaps, rather than uh, uh, state conflicts from which they were, were designed for. Uh, I also have a question directed to, to uh, Ms. Durham. Uh, in my association, or in our association, we are uh, a lot of, of uh, forward-looking students interested in, in international law and international conflicts. And I was wondering if uh, you would like to share perhaps uh, something about your story uh, coming into this, this subject, or if you have any uh, tips or uh, ideas you would like to uh, uh, extend to, to our members. Thank you very much. I'm going to take the um, very modern looking headband off because it just, I felt like I was singing on the voice or something. <laughs> and that would be really bad. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll use it like this, if that's okay, Ambassador. Um, thank you for your question. Um, they're both very important questions and could take a lot of time, so let me be limited. Um, 
Yes, today we see more non, non-international armed conflicts, more NIAC as we call it, than we see international armed conflicts, and there's a whole range of reasons for that. And the laws of war were written prior, mostly the Geneva Conventions cover international armed conflicts, Common Arctic 3 uh, doesn't, but we do believe in the ICRC that there are elements that we need to at least look at very carefully and if we can't create new law, because currently I think one could say the multilateral in- environment is very polarised, it's hard to get new law. We would not get today what we got way back in the 70 years ago. So a particular topic, for example, that the ICRC is working on, my team is looking at the laws as it pertains to detention, because in international armed conflict, we have the third Geneva Convention and a very full range of legal rights if you're a prisoner of war. But what we're experiencing, I think I flagged, is the terrible treatment of detainees in non-international armed conflict. And we're really trying to look at what are some of the best practices globally that we could capture and move forward in this NIAC detention. So yes, there are many other topics, but that's certainly one to flag. I'll let the other uh, others um, chip in on that because we've got a very eminent panel with great brains. So um, did you want to add to that? I'm not sure I have, uh, uh, to the very specific uh, question you had, I'm not sure I I really would have much to add. But one element I would just like to bring up, and uh, sort of also coming back to your role in 1998 uh, 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 with the ICC, and and also what you're saying now on on the developments, the perception of international law, where we definitely see that there is a a certain uh, headwind at the moment. I mean, we had uh, some golden years in, uh, mm-hmm. up through the 1990s uh, uh, into the zeros, and I would almost say after post 9-11, it, it started turning uh, the other way around. So that's, that's sort of one scenario we, s- we see. But then there's another one where, uh, uh, taking the outset in the ICC, where we saw initially the initiative be taken in Trinidad, Tobago, we saw a number of African countries supporting it. And then hmm, the cases started coming in relation to, to Africa uh, and African uh, countries. And the, uh, the support was maybe less. We saw Burundi uh, withdrawing and other uh, states being more and more critical to the ICC. I think what we see now is an interesting shift again, moving in the more positive. And why is that? I think it has moved from being the critique of the international level to now seeing that the victim groups, the very grassroots and the victims, those who so say were victims in those conflicts in Sierra Leone, in uh, uh, Liberia and elsewhere, they are organizing also mm-hmm. together with the Red Cross and others. So now suddenly there is a push from the bottom up that actually are adhering, and as you rightly say, I mean, who are sort of keen on uh, supporting the internet and trust the international law, trust the international system, those who are directly, have uh, witnessed it in their everyday life. Uh, And you had your survey, which is extremely interesting, with the 49% who said, "We, we believe in international law. And we see some of the same now with the International Criminal Court, suddenly gaining a renewed support, also getting states to create national mechanisms to, to address uh, some of the issues. So these things are, are sort of shifting. I'm not sure I answered your, your question, but uh, anyhow. Did you want to add? Uh, I will come to the second part. Maybe not uh, directly correla- correlated to your question, but I just want to add a perspective concerning the human rights also, uh, that we're facing a challenge of making human rights coming to life and making it something tangible for all of us. And it concerns us here in Sweden too. We are glad to be uh, live in a peaceful country without any armed conflicts, but still human rights is something we need to fulfill every day. And human rights comes also with humanitarian responsibilities. And who are those for, for the leaders of today, but also who are those for for an ordinary person and a lot of the work we do at the Ralph Wallenberg Academy is to educate young people of today speaking about what are those 30 articles that the UN actually wrote down after the Second World War to prevent another Holocaust. What are those 30 articles and what 
does those mean to me as a person? What like rights do I have, but also what responsibilities do I have as a person? Um, and just thank you. And I think that's really important. And the interface, I mean, we could have a fabulous discussion amongst ourselves, the interface between human rights, the laws of war, how we can make sure that I look at it almost as, 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 a, as a protective covering, that we have no gaps. Where can we fill the gaps between different normative frameworks? But we won't have that discussion. Mm -hmm. I, you did ask me a second part of the question, which was how I got involved and maybe any hints for or advice for those who you are interested. Um, it's a long story, but I'll be very quick. I, many years ago in Australia, I'm Australian. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, currently living in Geneva, but Australian. I was working with some women's groups, um, and it's true, my CV, if you looked at it, even at uni before university, I was always doing a lot of work, working with some women um, on some issues, and then I had a friend who went to the former Yugoslavia, this was in the early 90s, to specifically work with women who had been victims of sexual violence, those who had been a part of the rape camps. Um, and I wrote to her, because it was the 90s, some of you may not believe, the young ones in this room, but there was no email. I wrote a letter to her and I said, what can we do here in Australia to assist the women in the former Yugoslavia? And she wrote back saying, they want rape deemed a war crime. And I wrote back to her and said, could we do a cake sale or could we, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I wasn't really looking at that as, I, I was wondering how we could do proactive work. And she said, actually, they have, they have needs, but they really, really want some, some clarification of what they suffered is unacceptable. So I realised at the time the Australian government was taking up to 14,000 uh, refugees from the Balkans, and I knew at the same time the Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia was being established, a, juris a um, enforcement mechanism. And so I rang the Australian government because I had this idea, with the, with the refugees coming to Australia, surely amongst them would be some women and, and maybe men, but who had been victims of sexual violence, and the best way to develop jurisprudence or case law is to have cases. And I remember I rang, it was it's actually DFAT, I rang DFAT and I must have been very irritating, I was very enthusiastic, and I rang and I said, how, how is the Australian government taking the evidence from the refugee population as they come to Australia to pass it on to The Hague? And the, the gentleman in DFAT said, I'm, I'm sorry, who are you? I said, oh, I'm just an interested citizen, I just want to know, and I repeated, and he said, well, we're not, and I said, well, okay, but, but why not? We've we should. And he, I never forget, he said to me, listen, little lady, if you want to take the evidence, take it yourself. And he hung up. <laughs> and I really don't like being called little lady at all. So I thought, why not? <laughs> um, so I got together with a group of equally enthusiastic um, young lawyers and we set up a little group that... Um, went out to the refugee population and asked if they wished to give evidence, and we were wider than sexual violence. And, um, and then w through that process, I actually came across, at that stage I was doing more human rights, I came across the Geneva Conventions. And frankly, I fell in love. I looked at these and I thought, my gosh, this idea, just the idea that in the worst time of human history, you can have these laws that try and reduce suffering Wow, that's pretty exciting. Um, and so from there I did a master's and then I went to New York and did a PhD and then joined the Red Cross. So it was really by experience of thinking that there's something that we could do. So that's a bit of a long story, but it actually came about DFAT, a gentleman calling me little lady, so I have to thank them. Mm. Um, the advice I would give is, you know, I always, and I think I said this last time I was in Sweden, I was at a panel, I think to be a good international lawyer you have to have three Ps. You have to be passionate, because you have to be passionate, because otherwise you're hitting your head against a wall, and, and if you're not passionate, after the second time, you'll stop. You have to be patient. As I mentioned, I think there's a temporal element, and you have to be persistent. So if you can deal with those three things that often fight amongst themselves, when you're passionate, you want it to all happen, mm -hmm. um, I think that that is certainly something that I wish someone had told me many years ago. Um, and then I would say it's a combination, and maybe we can talk over the coffee, but it's a combination of voluntary work, internships, study, experiences, talking to people. It's not a one-way path in my experience. It is absolutely glorious today to see how much interest young people have in this area. I have, an, I have 24 internship places in my, um, in my department. Um, 140 lawyers globally and 24 internship places. And the last one we got over 700 applications for one position of an intern in Geneva. And anyone that tells me today that young people are not interested in the world, I just look them in the eye and say, well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. So, um, 
be persistent, passionate, and maybe if, if you're lucky, maybe the Australian ambassador can insult you over coffee mm. and it might fire you up to become an international lawyer. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You can see we train our Australian diplomats <laughs> <laughs> very thoroughly. Thanks. That's, that's fantastic responses from all three. Who else might have? Thanks very much. Yes, it's coming. Hi, my name is Mona and I work for the Red Cross Academy. And my question, thank you for a lovely presentation about courage in complex times. My question is uh, to Dr. Helen Durham. Um, how can we, because you talked about young people, how can we cultivate abilities such as courage and creativity uh, for positive change making among young people? Well, I actually might, because I feel I've talked enough. I might throw it to my other panellists and I'll speak last, because I think what you've articulated is a critical issue that I feel the great Wallenberry sitting here would also want to ask us. Um, so let me throw it to my other panellists. Yeah, thank you. What we do in the Royal Wallenberry Academy is to do leadership trainings for young people, and we see that young change maker have and older uh, change makers have some traits in common. And that is firstly the empathy, to start looking at yourself and then understand others, to put yourself in another man's shoes. And then the, uh, the second trait is the civil courage, to act upon your ability to feel empathy. And with empathy and civil courage, you can do, do a big difference in your closest group, but to make a bigger impact, then you need to also foster the ability to lead, to lead others and to make a clear vision and to set goals. And then the fourth one is the skills of collaborating. And that is a great example of the deeds of Raoul Wallenberg, how you can create a huge crowd of people working towards a mutual vision and same goals. And uh, a fifth one, and it's a bit extra spice on it, you need the creativity to find the creative solutions and complex um, challenges. And the question is, how do you, how do you uh, build those traits? How do you become a, a courageous, empathic leader who collaborates with others? Well, there's no simple answer to that question, I think, but the most important is that we need to, to to keep on training those skills. We used to say that civil courage is like any other muscle. You need to go to the gym, not only once, but, but you need to go to the gym over and over and over again. And, and you can never stop because it's a con continuous work that you're, you're never completely done. So we need to understand that we're never fully learned. We need to continue and continue to develop our skills and to talk about those issues over and over again. I think I would basically echo uh, Dr. Durham on, on saying that we, we see an enormous engagement and, and commitment, and we need it. I mean, we really need the, the youngsters, the new generations on board, not only for sort of say the generational shift. Uh, I'm probably the oldest on the, on the panel here. The should uh, hopefully there's some uh, coming uh, behind. But also to sort of take give us some new ideas. As I talked about briefly before, saying we, we are in sort of a, a, a headwind at the moment on international law, human rights. There are, uh, it is concerning. And I think if it should be a little bit self-critical, one of the things that we have not been very good at, that is how do we communicate this? How do we reach out mm -hmm. to the next generation, the youngsters, and but also much wider than that? You could say the history of, of the Second World War Holocaust or Wallenberg, is, is, is waning. Of course, some of us try to keep it alive, but, but we also need some new narratives, new ways of communicating it. And I don't think it's, it's probably most Sarah in, in this panel uh, who sort of is, is closest to think how do we reach that. It's something we have started also, the Academy and the Institute uh, uh, in Lund and, and Stockholm, joining up. Uh, in a major project that we hope to launch from, from this fall on, on actually that stronger uh, outreach and rethink uh, the human rights and international law, international humanitarian law, communication uh, part of it. So uh, that would be my... Mm -hmm. And I would definitely agree with my learned panel here that it is... Um, I loved your steps. That's, that's mm. really, really good 
good, uh, good advice. But I also think we need to work out how do we harness the energy of the past, but as I think both of you have said, transform it so it has more traction today. And I think this is an issue, it's not just an issue about um, uh, in, in a culture such as Sweden or where I come from in Geneva, it's also how we explain it through other cultures and, and find other tractions. And certainly in the ICRC, we've been looking really seriously. We're excellent at going around the world and talking about the Geneva Conventions. And certainly when I was a delegate in Papua New Guinea, up in the highlands with the, with the warring tribes, you say Geneva and they might know Swiss chocolate, but it's not really, you know, how do you put that story into a context that means something? Because it's actually not just about the intellect, it's about something that has traction with people. And I do think that um, new technologies have an incredible opportunity. They offer us incredible uh, ways. A part of uh, the law and policy department in Geneva actually is in, in Bangkok physically, but is looking at video games and the laws of war. How do you teach IHL not through the four conventions and common article three, but through young people playing video games, where in fact, if you do kill a civilian, you get taken out of the game for, for 10 minutes. You know, how do we find new ways to capture the attention of um, the way young people think. I've got a, a, a beautiful, two beautiful children, a 13-year-old and a 17-year-old, and it's only when they occasionally look on the ICRC website and there's a film clip or something that they actually vaguely understand what I'm doing, although it's not a child's job to understand what a parent does, but it's fascinating to see what impacts upon my 17-year-old son and his friends. Um, and it's not the way that I would have, when I was 17, wanted to absorb it. So it's how we use the bright brains. And, and I think this is a philosophical issue. And be OK to let go of things. Be OK to say things in a different way. Um, and that's, that's, that's yeah. not easy. It's yeah. not easy when we want to explain it the way we understand it, but to do it through a video game rather than a really excellent lecture on Common Article 3. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also moving away from that it's by definition good. I mean, yeah. sort of, yeah. if you don't understand it, it's your problem. Because what we do is by definition yeah. good. Yeah. So, I mean, we have to sort of put some more words to it and understand why some people in certain situations react to it and take it from there, take it from where people are. Thank you for those. Um, we, We've gone, all, uh, I'm at fault here, we have gone a little over time, but I'd love to get a couple more questions in if, if uh, we have some. Yes, great, in the middle. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a, my name is Grace, I'm a student at the University of Swedish Defence studying IHL. Um, where do you see the law developing in the areas of non-international armed conflict in the issue of detaining ships that you spoke about? Oh, excellent. A good black letter law question. Um, <laughs> currently, I think there is particular areas that when I talk to uh, the operational lawyers in the field, the particular areas we think we need to look into potentially developing one is um, detention in a non-international armed conflict close to the battlefield. We increasingly see that as a place that is huge vulnerabilities. The second is the area of the transfer of prisoners when they're transferred from one party to another. We know that that has huge vulnerabilities and the laws around that are rather porous, not very thorough. And then the third area that we're actually holding a meeting on soon is um, looking at uh, short-term detention, such as screening, that often turns into long-term detention. So what we're seeing in countries like Syria and others of the screening of civilians and even uh, those that have been involved in the fight, the screening process can sometimes take a long time and, and there's not really the clarity of the process to ensure humane treatment. So close to the battlefield, transfer of detainees and screening are just short, sharp answers that might interest you. That's great. Thanks very much, Helen. Anyone got a final burning question? And if not, then I might just sort of do a couple of other things and close off. So the first thing I'd like to do then, I think I mentioned that Kate Watch was hopefully, and here she is, <laughs> Kate, it's so lovely to have you. Kate is another 
a person who has had, you know, the personal experience of surviving uh, the Nazi regime. And um, I talked, Kate, a little bit about uh, Emmerich and also Haiti. And um, if it's okay, I might just give a quick summary of what I've learned about you in a little bit of research that we've done. But I haven't had time to talk about it with you first. So. Maybe I'll just uh, tell you what I know, and you, or you can tell me when. Okay. Um, so Kate was born in, in 1932. Great, we got the first fact right. <laughs> we're, we're on a roll, we're on a roll. Like, um, and lived in the, the, the Budapest ghetto through the German occupation and also the period of the Hungarian Nazi Arrow Cross regime. Along with thousands of others, Kate credits her survival to the uh, protective passport issued by Raoul Wallenberry. Her mother and her brother, Gustav Kadelberger, also assisted the efforts of Raoul Wallenberry and other Swedish diplomats at the time. Kate has been here in Sweden since the 1950s, the early 1950s, and has worked very extensively to ensure that Raoul Wallenberry's memory and the memory of other human saviors working in Budapest is preserved in Sweden, in Hungary, and internationally. Many, many contributions, much involvement in films and books and music and exhibitions, including helping to design the Raoul Wallenberry Room here at the Army Museum. And there will be an opportunity to have a look and a tour through that room towards the end of, of the reception um, today. Yes, please do, Kate. Kate, that's fair. Would you like to? We can talk about. Fantastic. Wonderful. Great. Thank you so much for being here. And look, I just wanted to really acknowledge Kate and Heidi and Emmerich. Thank you, Kate. I hope your husband gets better. Uh, they can be troublesome things, husbands. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, just to do a, fi a, a couple of, of closing comments, I mean, I, I hope you have found this as, as rewarding and inspiring as I have. Um, thank you, Morton. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Helen. It's, it's really been a fantastic um, series of conversations. Uh, I also wanted, I know this is maybe a little indulgent, but this doesn't seem like a big event, but for an embassy, a small embassy like Australia, it, it, this has taken a really big effort from our embassy, so I wanted to sincerely thank our team at the embassy for helping to, um, to get this uh, up and running. And as I said, we hope and, and trust that it will build in profile and impact over time, and I think we're off to a, a, brilliant, a brilliant beginning. We clearly identified this in the Australian Embassy as a priority. Um, and so why did we do that? Well, I won't go on, but I just want to say briefly that last year Australia released a, a foreign policy white paper, which was its first in 14 years. And that white paper makes the following point. It says, we live in a time where the international rules-based order is under real threat from countries directly challenging, ignoring, or undermining international law. Similarly, the rules and the institutions that help maintain peace and security and guide global cooperation are under strain. In some cases, major powers are ignoring or undermining international law. It also went on to say that it's clear that these risks are compounded if countries and others do not defend rules when they are challenged. Australia is committed to defending and advancing the international rules-based order. But we're striving not to just defend any sort of order, but order of a particular character. I guess you might say a liberal rules-based order. And again, just a brief excerpt from the white paper. Australia's values are a critical component of the foundation upon which we build our international engagement, our support for political, economic and religious freedoms, liberal democracy, the rule of law, racial and gender equality and the mutual respect 
reflect who we are and how we approach the world. So in this work, we stand shoulder to shoulder with Sweden and also with other partners, civil society, non-governmental organisations like the International Committee of the Red Cross, like the Wallenberry Institute and the Wallenberry Academy, Raoul Wallenberry Institute and Academy. That's why today has been such a priority for us, to continue this work and to continue to stand up for the sort of world that we think is achievable and, uh, and such a priority.